All right, uh, so we are on time and I have a lot to cover. So first of all, thank you uh, OSS Summit for having me. Uh, thank you everyone for showing up. And uh, yeah, my name is Pablo and I'll be talking about how to identify and mitigate cloud and container threats. So let's get started. A little bit about me, I'm a uh, DevRel, Developer Relationship in uh, Sysdig. Uh, I've been in open source for more than 15 years now. Uh, community organizer with meetups, uh, conferences, and stuff. But uh, education is really my thing, like training, uh, delivering talks, creating content, that, that's what I really like to do. So a little bit about you. Uh, put your hands up if you use containers. Okay, that's great, that's what I expected. If you use Kubernetes, good. If you consider yourself a developer, wow. If you consider yourself ops or DevOps person. Come on, are you a developer or DevOps? You need to choose. No, we don't. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and uh, put your hands up if you consider yourself a security person. Okay, a few. Uh, do you know what eBPF is? Okay, could you come here and explain it? <laughs> and uh, do you know what Falco is? All right, just uh, a few. All right, so I'm gonna be talking uh, a little bit about uh, eBPF, security, Falco, but also on the generic idea on uh, securing containers. So I'll start with talking about images, minimal images, vulnerability management, uh, image signing, registry, then I'll talk about runtime security. I'll run a demo here to give you like a, a hands-on idea of how it goes and how to detect runtime threats, and then I'll just do some closing remarks. All right, we good to go? So when I think about containers, and I think most people think as well, is like you think about the container running, right? You think about the runtime part. But for the container to be running, it actually needs an image to run. And that image needs to come from a registry, which needs to be actually published to the registry. And at some point, you need to build that image to be able to publish. And you need a source code to actually build that image. And also like a base image to get from in most cases, right? And the great problem is all of them are tech vectors, right? So if you're just thinking about runtime, you have a problem. If you're just thinking about the build time, you have a problem. If you're just thinking about your registry, you have a problem. You need to think about the, the thing holistically. Right? So that's what I'm going to try to cover one step at a time. So let's start with the source code. You're a developer, you have a repository, you send your code in there. Uh, what's of course really important is access to that repository should be controlled. And you should actually think about less privilege uh, uh, to make sure that only people uh, should, that should have access to it will have access to it and that's all they have, not more, not less, right? You need to think about credentials. You don't want to have leaked credentials into your repositories as people are pushing code. You need to think about source code scanning, and yesterday we were just talking about that here uh, on stage with Andrew and uh, Matt Jarvis as well. Uh, you need to be thinking about the vulnerabilities that you have within your code, but also the vulnerabilities that could be injected into your code from your machine in to go into the repository. And finally, about third-party dependencies. What are you using to actually be able to run your code or to uh, put your application together? Are any vulnerabilities in there? Is there anything that you want to look into? And uh, you need to make sure that everything is sound. So in this case, you want to catch the malicious code before build. And then it goes into build. What are we worried about now? Same thing. Less privilege, you just want to give access to the services and people that need it, and you just want to give enough rights for them to do exactly what they need to do. Not more, not less. You want to think about a trusted base image and not just getting it from a public repository, and I'm gonna go deeper into that in a bit. Uh, you want to think about CI, CD malware injection. So from the source code in your repository into the build, the attacker could be basically there in the middle and inject something that's actually going to end up in your image, actually is going to end up in your uh, runtime. 
And finally, crypto mine build machines, uh, attackers are also using once they get access to that, either the repository or the build pipeline, uh, they can basically change things in there. Sometimes they just put a crypto mining on those uh, jobs they're running and they're just doing crypto mining while you're doing your builds. So those are things that actually happen just now in real world. So you want to catch the malicious code before publishing it, and you want to make sure that the attackers are not actually exploiting your infrastructure within this part. Then we go into the image registry, right? So we have the build, it's done, and we basically want to store it somewhere. Again, what do we want to think about? Less privilege principles and registry misconfiguration. So in some cases, people set up the registry as being public because, oh, right now it can be public and later on someone that's not uh, aware of it is just publishing an image that actually should be in a private repository. What is the problem? There could be data in that image, which should not happen, but happens that attackers can just start exfiltrating or getting from there and uh, that's not gonna be good, right? Uh, registry break-in, so attackers can basically break into your registry and have access to private images that should not be there. So configure and secure your registry. Uh, on the image itself, we can talk about the vulnerabilities that we have in the image, and I'll have more slides later to specifically focus on that. But things that we're gonna be looking into is having minimal images. The image should not be bloated, should not have extra packages, uh, should not have things that are not gonna be used at runtime, right? Distroless, been talking a lot about that lately. Uh, also, after you have the image and you know that you have vulnerabilities, how do you prioritize those vulnerabilities? How do you look into vulnerabilities? They're actually gonna have a huge impact into your environment instead of wasting time with vulnerabilities that are not even exploitable. And finally, the image configuration, again, list privilege principle. You don't want to be giving uh, root privileges to your image uh, within the configuration if you don't have to, if you don't need to. And what we know that happens a lot is you as a developer or just a DevOps person, but within the dev environment, you're just like, okay, let me just put root here. It's going to be easier. I need all those packages in there. And later on, you forget to basically remove and to make uh, hygiene into that image and ends up in a bad story. So minimize the image attack surface. That's the idea of this point. Okay, now we get into runtime and now it gets a bit more complicated. So you did all the steps that I discussed before, but uh, you're just out there in the open and attackers, they're gonna exploit everything they can. So one of the common attack factors is public malicious images. Uh, so if you don't trust the base image that you're getting, uh, just make sure you start trusting them, right? Because there are a lot of images out there, they're just malicious. And in some cases they do like typo squatting, which is just changing two letters of the name of the image. You don't even notice because our brain is too smart for that. And voila, you have now an image that's basically a malicious one with a backdoor or crypto mining that's gonna be running in there. Container scape, so from the container itself, uh, if they get access to it, they start scaping, exhalating privileges in there. Uh, vulnerable hosts, so you're running containers, but they run within a host. So you need to take a look into the host itself because if there is a vulnerability, there's a chance that attackers are gonna exploit uh, that as well. Zero day vulnerabilities, there's not a lot that we can do about that. After all, there's zero day, it's just like completely new vulnerability that no one knew about but uh, there are ways of uh, speeding up your remediation on top of that. Social engineering attacks, credentials being stolen, uh, all the things that we listen and talk about like uh, in our daily lives. Yep, so catch the suspicious behavior uh, after other measures are put in place. Always remember, security is about layers, right? It's not about one solution or the other solution. It's about making sure that your environment is harder to break into than your neighbor's environment. That's basically uh, the notion of being secure. Good, so now let's go into each of those topics or at least the most important ones. So starting with a minimal image. So you need a base image to run out of, right? And it's really important that you start with a minimal image. So here's an example of a node image 
that uh, basically has 15 critical vulnerabilities and 153 high vulnerabilities within the image. And if you actually get a slim version of that image, it goes down into one critical vulnerability and to three high vulnerabilities. Like, it's a huge difference in there. And maybe none of those are actually exploitable or going to be in use, so attackers could not actually make use of them. But still, why would you uh, increase your attack surface, right? So use a library of base images from a trusted source and make sure that you only have what you need. Bloated images is very common, very similar to the previous topic. So this is the minimal size and this is the actual size. So if you compare a standard UBI image, you, it has 37.5 megabytes. If you look into an Alpine one, that's 5.7. This is a 6.5 size difference and that's exactly what I tried to mirror within the font and the cube in there. And everything that's in there is just useless. It's just uh, potential things for attackers, right? And that's what you want to avoid. So if you're not using, just get rid of it. Like developers create the image, they need some packages, it's easier for development, and then they just don't do the hygiene. That's very, very important. So attacker tools, that's the second thing. So after the attacker got access into an environment, into a host or into a container, like they need tools to keep digging, to keep exploiting your environment, right? Tools like curl for like uh, downloading scripts they're gonna run, VI and Nano to edit those scripts uh, on the fly, APK, NPM, package managers to basically download new tools that they might use. We're talking about tar and unzip, usually that's how they got files. If config, netcat, all those things are tools that might be in the image that are just gonna help the attacker. And they basically love those tools. If they are there, that's amazing. They're gonna be very happy. However, if you don't have it there, if you have minimal images, you're just gonna break their heart. They get in there and there's not much that they can do. They cannot even open a file to edit. They cannot download a file from like an external source, which is the script that they wanna run. So they can still exploit things, but it just makes it way harder for them. All right, so by removing those tools, you're basically saying, okay, you know like those attackers that don't know much, that could actually break things? No, now you actually need people that really know how to go into like low level code stuff and really do things well, which is like not a lot of them out there. Good, uh, in terms of vulnerabilities and images, uh, the way you build your images, the way you use the layers, that's also very important, right? Here it's an example. So we have a base image in version 1.1. There is a CVE, so a vulnerability that we, fear we found, and we wanna fix that. That same vulnerability could be in a layer. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, by the time you discover vulnerability and you associate that vulnerability with one of the layers, all you need to care about is fixing that specific layer. You don't need to go and change everything. So you fix that layer and you basically send out the patch and that's good. This is fixed without having to worry. And that also helps you pinpoint when someone says, oh, there's a vulnerability in log4j, where is that? That brings you all the way back to, okay, that's actually just in the base image. Uh, we don't need to, take, to change any code within the layers that we have. Okay, so far so good. So let's move into vulnerability management. So we have vulnerabilities in images, that's a fact. Actually, 87% of container images, they have a high or a critical vulnerability, right? But that's not really a problem. Many of those vulnerabilities, they cannot be exploited and that's what we are looking for. So from those high or critical vulnerabilities, only 71% have a fix available, which is okay, we can fix a bunch of them, but are you gonna fix them all? That's a lot of work, right? Which ones, which of those packages are actually in use? Which one of those are actually loaded into memory so attackers can exploit them, right? And which one of those are actually exploitable? They have an exploit out there that people can actually exploit in the way that your environment is configured. So if you do the proper homework and you look into those, you end up with only 2% of those vulnerabilities that actually matter, 
right? So instead of having your team like completely swamped with, I don't know, a thousand vulnerabilities to fix and to look into, now you basically reduce that into 20, right? So that's what you want to do. You want to prioritize. You want to use runtime insights. So what's running in your container, you want to be able to see that, to have an agent in there that collects data. So later on, you can actually optimize uh, your team, optimize the work that you do. Uh, one way of thinking about this in-use vulnerability prioritization is like this. So, sorry, it's a bit smaller. Uh, image registry, we have an image in there. That image has three uh, vulnerabilities that we know about. And when we go into runtime and we have our container running, actually, the only ones that are loaded into memory, it's only one of those three, right? So there is only one vulnerability in there. So what you want to ask yourself is what is the real risk? So, do I have vulnerabilities in runtime? Yes, I have plenty of them. Are they in use? Yes, so that's what I'm start focusing on. Are they exploitable? Yes, so I'm gonna really focus on those. Do they have a fix? Yes, how can I fix it? Is it the dev team? Is it the ops team? Who do I need to talk to to fix it right away? Oh no, they don't have a fix yet. There is no patch for that. Then you're gonna go talk to your threat team or your security experts on how can you remediate that? Are you gonna write a rule? Are you gonna increase a, a firewall policy or something like that to actually be able to stop that specific vector that you just figured out? And then you're gonna remediate that uh, the way you can. But that's the high priority just in there. That's what we really care about or how we should be spending our time Good, image signing and registry. So as I said, attackers, they try to find any way to get into your environment. One way they do is they publish images out in the open, hoping that at some point you might just mistype the name of an image or you just might, okay, let me download this. Oh, let me read the Stack Overflow. Oh, that's the image that they are saying that I should use. And then you just put that in your code. And by that point, you now have a malicious image that's being added to your environment. And they do a few things with those images. They have crypto mining. So that was a study done by uh, Sysdig back in 2022. And they found out approximately 700 <coughs> images out there that were malicious, either based on the IP, on the domain, or because they had secrets like that. And they have different ways of actually trying to exploit the you after you actually put those images in your environment. So crypto mining is one of them, embedded secrets, uh, so they can do SSH and stuff and other uh, options. So for that, you can have trusted images and image signing is an important step into just using trusted images, right? So the main benefits are your container image integrity, images are from a trusted source, and there is a safe handover from one step to the other step within the pipeline, right? So your developer, okay, gets a base image, it's a trusted one, starts working, it needs a new image, it starts working on that image, it's a bloated one because for development, that's how you speed things up. You have all the tools in there. You have all the packages. That's great. At some point, I really hope you're going to do the hygiene. You're going to start trimming down and making sure that your image is actually uh, a minimal one. And then you want to publish that. So you're going to sign that and you're going to say, okay, here it is, my sign image, and you're going to send it to QA. And QA is going to make sure that the only image that you're going to use to test is the signed image from developers. That's how you make sure that you're testing what you should be testing. And the same thing is going to happen from QA to production. You're going to sign it again, and you're going to make sure that the signature is verified when we go into production. Yeah, there's a lot of work in here. Yes, it's up to you to accept the risks. Uh, I know that the teams are not infinite and we have a, a limited amount of time to actually work on things, but you need to balance the risks and decide where you're gonna invest your time, right? So there is some work to do here. It's not that hard, there are tools out there that help you uh, doing that. But uh, once you start putting processes uh, and getting used to it, uh, it just gets easier. Good. All right, so I'll pause here, let it sink in, and I'm going to go into the new part of the... All right, 
so runtime security. So why runtime security? You have multiple layers in security, right? I just talked about a few of them within containers. But after you have your container running, bad things can still happen. Suspicious things can still happen. You might be on your computer, you might do a git push, and you might have a key in there, and that's a problem. You probably don't want this to happen. Or you might be in your computer again, just changing the configuration of your Kubernetes cluster, adding a new pod, and that pod is a privileged pod. Should it be a privileged pod? Maybe yes, and that's fine. But if that was not the case, you probably want to be alerted about that and know about it. Uh, someone in your uh, company tried to log in into uh, AWS without using MFA. Nowadays, that's a big issue. Like you should probably be looking into that. Uh, someone is trying to escalate their privilege e either from a container or from a host, just running a command associated with a CVE, you probably want to be alerted about all that as well. So, things have changed, and instead of just putting firewalls and not letting people in, now everything is interconnected, right? So what you need is, instead of blocking services from talking to each other, is to make sure that you have good security cameras all over the place that can actually let you know when something bad happens. Right? So you want to have a camera looking to the Linux hosts, looking to those containers, looking to Kubernetes. And they're going to be looking at system calls and collecting those system calls. So everything that happens in a, in a Linux uh, machine goes through the kernel, right? If you want to access a file, if you want to access a socket to, send, uh, to use the network, uh, if you want to access memory, everything goes within the kernel, right? And Having visibility into system calls allow you to really understand what's going on. So within Kubernetes, you might want to take a look into the Kubernetes logs to look if it, a privileged pod is being started. Into AWS, you might want to look into CloudTrail. That's where service logs go, and you want to see if maybe someone tried to log in without MFA, or if someone just added an admin role to another account. And after you collect all this data, you want to be able to analyze this data, uh, the way we do is we run the event against a set of rules, and if it match one of the rules, we send an alert. Oh, this is suspicious, right? And you want to be able to send this to a place where you actually have visibility, either a CM or a Slack message, pager duty, it doesn't matter, that's up to you. So, runtime security and Falco. Falco is an open source runtime security solution, right? It's under the CNCF, and you can use it right now. Just go, download it, and start it. Uh, it's basically for threat detection across Kubernetes, containers, hosts, and the cloud. When I talk about cloud, I'm talking about GitHub, I'm talking about Kubernetes auto logs, I'm talking about AWS CloudTrail and more. When I'm talking about Kubernetes containers and hosts, I'm talking about collecting those system calls. Containers are processes. Kubernetes is just on top of all that. Everything goes through the system call. If we tap into the kernel and we look into system calls, we have visibility into all those layers. It's an incubation level project. We applied to graduation almost last year. Uh, we are waiting uh, from a word from the TOC any day now, probably in the next five days. Hopefully it's gonna be a, a good one. Falco comes with more than 80 default rules for a system call. If you're using AWS a Cloud Trail, there are default rules for that. Kubernetes audit logs, there are also default rules for that. And we're gonna be looking into crypto mining, executing shell, uh, mutating the binaries, privilege escalations, and much more. So, Falco can tap into the kernel to get system calls. It can tap into what we call plugins to get also external source of data, like Kubernetes audit logs and the one I said. And when we output this, those alerts, we go, there are many ways. There is standard out, there is syslog, the traditional ones, but you can also use HTTPS to send to Falco's younger brother, Falco Sidekick. And Falco Sidekick has more than 50 different integrations like Slack, Elasticsearch, Kafka, PagerDuty, etc. And you can even do things like, oh, if priority is greater than or equal to critical, send me a pager duty because I want to know right away. Otherwise, just send me to my uh, data lake or to my CM, whatever. 
Good. So going a bit deeper into how Falco actually works on the system call level, uh, we have the kernel here and we tap into the kernel using a kernel module or a eBPF probe. So eBPF and the kernel module allows you to basically hook the kernel and when there are syscalls, you basically put a trace point in there, you get that system call and what it does is it write to a ring buffer. That's a non-blocking, it's not changing the behavior of anything, it's just visibility. We collect that event, that system call, we write it to the ring buffer. Falco process running on user space is constantly looking into that ring buffer and reading events from that ring buffer, those same syscalls that the kernel was writing to, and it's matching them against a set of rules and saying, this is suspicious, drop it, this is not suspicious, drop it, drop it, drop it. Oh, this is suspicious, send an alert, right? Important things here to call out is a state engine that allow Falcos to enrich the data. Most IDSs, intrusion detection systems out there, don't have it. They don't have visibility into Kubernetes. They don't have visibility into containers. They lack all that metadata that Falco adds. And uh, yeah, finally a rich set of rules that uh, we match against. All right, so it's time for my demo. Uh, before I actually started, uh, let me just play the track here. Should take a few seconds. And while it's starting, let me just explain what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna talk about Log4Shell. Who here is familiar with Log4Shell? Okay, who heard the name Log4Shell before my talk? Okay, not a lot of people. So there was a vulnerability on Log4J uh, discovered at the end of 2021, uh, 22, yeah, 21. And basically that was 13 years later, nine years later, it was introduced in 2013, found in 2021, and largely exploited in 2022. It was crazy, right? Like Log4, uh, Log4J is used in many, many, many Java applications out there. The attack consists of the attacker, that's me, uh, the vulnerable server, that's any Java uh, application that's running using Log4J with access uh, from the network, and the malicious server, that's an LDAP server that I'm gonna put there as an attacker, right? So as an attacker, I'm gonna send a malicious request with a payload. This payload is gonna exploit Log4J Basically, the JNDI here forces Log4J to run this, which forces uh, the Java process to go into that address to basically collect a specific uh, Java class. So the vulnerable server sends an LDAP request to my malicious server, which sends back a malicious Java class that's gonna be executed. I can even put here in this payload what I want to be executed. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in there a netcat request back to myself. So I'm gonna be here listening with netcat at a port, and then it's just gonna open a reverse shell. And from that reverse shell, I'm gonna start poking with the environment, trying to find things in there and do bad things. So my environment is ready. Uh, let me start. I'm gonna need some help from you back there. Can you read this all the way back there? Perfect, thank you very much. So this is one machine, that's the uh, developer or the vulnerable server. It just has uh, a Java running. That's the account portal here. I could even kubectl logs account portal. Oops. Yeah. So I can check the logs of the application. Uh, I can just open here. Oh. Wow. Something bad happens here. Uh, let me just try to. Wow. That's a bug. I never saw that before. That's the problem with live demos. What? My internet is just failing. Let me see. Okay. That's not good. I did that demo like more than 10 times now, and it never failed me. So that's weird. Anyway, uh, we have a username here, and a password here. And I'm just gonna log in. Uh, we did not recognize, sorry. And 
Let's see. Okay. So the admin is here. So it's not too broken. Oof. Uh, as an attacker, I'm going to start the LDAP server. So I'm going to be listening. Uh, then I'm also going to start my NATCAT. Sorry, this is, the vulnerable, this is the malicious server that's going to be waiting to send the malicious uh, class. This is me listening on NATCAT for the reverse shell. And this is me just generating the payload. Remember that I said that I'm going to send an NCAT, a NATCAT, just basically opening a shell. So I'm going to get the payload. And hopefully this lovely application is just going to load, which doesn't look like. Oh, it does. Perfect. And it doesn't matter the password. I'm going to log in. Oh, I don't recognize you. And now if I go to attacker2, who am I? Voila. I just got an access with the exploit. If we go back here and we look into the logs, that's basically what happened, right? Like it's just exploiting the whole thing. So as an attacker, what can I do from here? So I can start poking around. Of course, I set things up, but that's what an attacker would do. I don't have the time to actually be the attacker. So I can try to find secrets. And let's say I actually found here your Kubernetes cluster configuration, which is something should not be there, but you would be surprised that many people still do it. Uh, just to show that I'm actually in a different one, get pods minus A. I don't have access to anything. I'm going to create a config file. So I'm going to set up my attacker machine to have full access to the vulnerable cluster, right? Now I'm in. I'm in your Kubernetes cluster. I can do whatever I want. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm basically going to open a shell, because if the netcat ends the connection, I'm out. So that's just easier for me. Then I'm going to download a crypto mining uh, package, and I'm just going to run the crypto mining. That's not much happening here. It's just a wget, untar, and then just running the binary that I just downloaded. And that's basically what I did. So that was me from the attacker perspective. What's happening on the other side, right? So Falco was running all this time. It was running as a Kubernetes, kubectl, uh, get pods minus a. Falco was just running here. It was running with Falco Sidekick. Falco Sidekick not only gives output, but Falco Sidekick also gives a nice UI that you can see what happened in there. So Falco was all the time running with the default rules, and let's see what we get. So yeah, now I need to basically probably go out. I'll try to explain as much as I can. I know the letters are not that big. So only one source, that was his call. We know that uh, we, we had notice, critical, error, and warning in this uh, proportion. Uh, here are some of the rules that we triggered overall, right below root, terminal shelling container, uh, launch ingress remote file copy tools in container, etc. Uh, if I click on events, I actually have a list of all the events that happened. And here I only have 10, but I can increase it so we can actually see all the steps from the attacker. So the first thing we actually did that was suspicious was a netcat remote code execution and container. That was me forcing the vulnerable application to actually get the Java. And after getting the Java, it actually executed this netcat outbound. So in here, I have access to the command that was executed. Oh, no. Let me go back. Sorry. I have access to the command that was executed, the container ID, which repository was that container coming from, the Kubernetes namespace, the Kubernetes pod name, all the metadata that you need to, to actually be able to uh, react to that. Uh, then we can just keep looking. So there was a redirect standard out that was from the netcat. It happened a few times. Then I opened the shell to the container. That was me already at the end. Uh, opening the shell to the container. Then there was me running the wget to download the file. So there were a few uh, system calls that actually happened in there. Uh, then there was a write below root because I just put it in the same directory. If I had put it to temp as an attacker, 
it would not catch it because it doesn't look into the temp directory. So that's also about the rule, but I don't have the time to actually show you the rules. Drop and execute new binary, that's one of the most interesting ones for me. So when you finish an image and you run that, that's assumed to be the base layer that's running. Like I'm not talking about the base image anymore. I'm just talking about the layer within the operating system that's running the container or the CRI, the container runtime that's running. There is a flag which is easy writable, e uh, sorry, easy upper layer that's associated uh, with, a, with a binary, right? Basically saying if that binary or that file was in the image when the image was actually used, right? So was that part of the image that you are using to this container? In that case, it's not because I downloaded that image. If you create a new file, that's a new thing, right? So that's basically gonna flag as critical, saying, hey, like, this is a container, someone is running a binary that was not here and was not expected, right? So that's a, a little bit uh, of the demo. Uh, it's basically giving you all that visibility. So that's Falco and Falco Sidekick. Uh, I don't have uh, Slack here. Uh, it's being recorded. I'm not going to open the Slack and I forgot to put. But actually, this is set to send it, the output to the Slack. And if I go to the Slack channel that I have, it's going to be there, right? It's going to basically say, hey, you've got a critical uh, activity you probably want to take a look at. All right, going back uh, just to wrap things up. Oops, not this one. So yeah, containers, they have a large attack surface. And it's from code, to build, to store, to run. And that means that not only security folks should take care of container security, right? It goes all the way back to developers. And having this uh, conversation is really, really important. So some takeaways. Make sure you have minimal images, right? Prioritize the vulnerability. So if you're spending time looking to vulnerabilities, make sure you prioritize and you really go after the ones that are in use at runtime. Trusted images. Don't get public images from out the open that you don't know that you're running in your production environment. Runtime security after all those layers is really, really important. And Falco gives you that visibility into what's happening and what's going on. Uh, there is an increasing uh, importance of list privilege and zero trust. You can see like all the conferences that you go, there is always a talk about zero trust, list privilege. Uh, like that's really, really important. It's not a new concept. People have been talking about that, I don't know, for what, 30 years more? Like, but now more than ever, there are just so many services, so many surfaces that you need to take care of that urgently. Uh, shift left, as I was saying, is a team collaboration, right, thing, and it matters to everyone, right, as the company name that's in stake, as the company data, it's like a big, uh, uh, big money that companies have to pay for uh, data leaks and stuff like this. And yes, eBPF uh, is the kernel instrumentation made simple. Uh, that's the part that I went a little bit uh, low level. Basically, how do we collect all this data from the host that applies to containers and uh, Kubernetes as well. Falco ecosystem, uh, just an overview, and uh, some references. So the PDF is already in the schedule. So if you want to download, those are some references. And we do Falco events. Basically, we are doing workshops around the world. There are a few in the US. I know the ones in Europe. We are going to London, Berlin, and Paris in October. I'm going to be in Portugal, and I'm trying to organize something in October as well. And we're trying to organize something in Barcelona and Madrid in, uh, in November. Those are two hour uh, workshops that we really go into cloud native security that I didn't touch here. And we really go into Falco, how it works, hands on experience, similar to the environment that I had here. You just give it a try, a lot of labs. Uh, here's the Falco book. If the subject interests you, it's a very nice book. It's easy to read. I read it a few times already. And uh, it gives you an overview of uh, a lot of interesting things. Really goes a uh, low level, it's free to download. Yep. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, if you have some questions, I'm more than happy to answer all of them.
No questions. Either I did a good job or a terrible job. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, Falco basically look into syscalls and analyze it. Is there a way to block uh, those syscalls, the suspicious one? Uh, not within Falco. You have other tools that try to do that. Uh, there are pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, basically, if you're stopping things from happening, you need to have a high certainty that that is really a bad thing. Uh, and by the time you stop it, it can have a huge influence in other things, right? Also, system calls are all the way down to the kernel level. If you start messing up things in there, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen with the application if you're going to block it, not block it. So we try to be as fast and efficient as possible. Like, we get the system call, we write to the ring buffer, the flow continues, right? So that's the idea within Falco. There are other tools there that work with policies that you can try to do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you.